Hi, everyone. This is Daniel Weisfield. I'm one of the co-founders of Three Pillar Communities. And hi, I'm, I'm Yoel Kalman, the other co-founder of Three Pillar Communities. So thank you for coming to our webinar. We're excited to talk to you about what we're doing, our strategy, and our origin story, how we got started in mobile home parks. Um, before we do that, let me just do the formality here. Quick disclaimer, none of this is legal advice, tax advice, or investment advice. Um, this is an equity investment. It involves certain risks, and it is only open to accredited investors. So I'd like to tell you guys a story about my family and where we came from. <coughs> my grandfather, Gideon Goldstein, was born on a chicken farm in Israel in 1931. And my mom was born on that chicken farm in 1956. And when my grandpa was a kid, they didn't have running water and they didn't have electricity. And he used to do his homework uh, with a kerosene lamp. And he talked about how the smoke used to fill up the whole living room. Uh, so that's where my grandfather grew up and my mom grew up and they worked really hard and my grandfather wanted more out of life. So he brought the family to America in 1967. Came with a few suitcases and like he always says, uh, you know, a hundred dollars in my pocket and a few suitcases and that was it, coming to a new land. And when he got here, he got a job working as a union electrician. And his buddies told him, you need to go buy a car to get to work. And he said, where am I gonna buy a car? I don't have a lot of money. And they said, go to the junkyard, see if you can find a deal. So my grandfather went to the junkyard and he saw a great car, only a year old, it only had 3000 miles on it. Perfect in the front, good engine, good bumpers, just crushed in the back. Uh, and then he found same car, same year, same model, perfect in the back. It just got crunched in the front. Uh, and they were $500 each. He said, I'll take them both. And he bought them both. He towed them home to his backyard in Seattle. And he cut them in half and he welded them together. And he sanded it and he painted it. And now he had a new car. Uh, this, is, this is a true story. I've seen pictures of this car. My grandfather talked about it very proudly. Um, and he made money. He had $1,000 spent and the new car was worth $5,000. Um, so he started, he realized, okay, you can make money in America if you hustle. And so he started doing more of these deals, buy wrecked cars, fix them in the backyard. And my mom always says her memories of my grandfather, when she was a kid, were not of his face or his hands, but they were of his feet sticking out underneath the car as he was wrenching, working hard, trying to get ahead. So eventually he saved up enough to buy a body shop. And as a kid, I'd go help him in the body shop in the summers. Yeah, we'd paint cars and fix bumpers. We'd run around town in his little pickup truck going to scrap yards and the junkyard to buy spare parts. And eventually saved up enough to buy a triplex in Seattle. And I'd go help him at the triplex, you know, paint the walls, change carpets, change locks, whatever needed to get done. And eventually I bought a mobile home park, a small one in Kenmore, Washington, about 40 years ago. Um, so we'd always be out there digging ditches, fixing pipes, mowing lawns, that kind of stuff in the summers when I was a kid. Um, and we started out, you know, digging trenches with a shovel and eventually he saved up enough to buy a ditch witch. And this was his pride and joy. So I have so many childhood memories of my grandfather firing up the ditch witch to go dig trenches to fix sewer pipes and water lines. Um, so I grew up around this business. Yoel also grew up around affordable housing, working uh, with his grandfather on his properties. And we realized mobile home parks serve a really important social need and they have very strong economic fundamentals. Um, you know, I just want to talk through the basic business model. You know, some of the reasons, even in this market environment right now, where we have intense inflation, interest rates are rising, assets are expensive. Even in this environment, we're still bullish on mobile home parks because of the fundamentals. Specifically, this is affordable home ownership. The basic model is we as the park investors own the land and the infrastructure and our tenants own their own home 
and they pay us lot rent every month for the land underneath the home. Um, and that creates a very stable tenancy. Our typical tenancy is more than eight years. Um, we have a deep demand for our product um, because our price point is very attractive. Whether the economy is up or down, people want to live in affordable housing. Uh, we help our residents create wealth through home ownership. And we see this as a very defensive investment uh, against in an inflationary environment like what we have now, because as prices rise, we're allowed to raise rents um, and that raises the value of our asset. Um, so Yo and I were both at a career transition about five years ago. Um, I had gotten a law degree and an MBA and I was working at a company called McKinsey doing strategy consulting. Um, and Yoel had sold his technology company. We were both deciding what to do next. And we decided to start a company to buy mobile home parks, building on my family's decades of experience in this asset class. And we really decided off the bat, we were going to be a mission-driven company. So we have a two-part mission. Number one, deliver safe, reliable housing to our residents. Number two, deliver safe, reliable returns to our investors. And we think we only succeed when we do both of those things. We love that we can have a really tangible social impact in this asset class, expanding the supply of affordable housing, helping our residents build wealth through home ownership, and protecting the planet through resource efficient factory built housing. Um, so I'd like to tell the story of really the day that Three Pillar Communities got started. We had identified this as our target asset class, a business that we love, it's, it's in our blood. And do we knew we wanted to go buy parks. And one day in, yo, was it July or August? I think July, 2017. Does that sound right? Oh, I, I know, yeah. yeah, I got a call from Yoel saying, um, my wife crashed her car. She's okay, thank God, but the car's totaled. And I've been looking on police auction websites to try and find a new car. So I was scrolling through and I saw a, you know, a Honda Civic and a Ford Focus. And then I saw a mobile home park on the police auction website. Um, and should we bid on it? I said, let's check it out. We checked it out and basically we found out there was a total scuzzball landlord who didn't fix the roads, didn't pay attention to his tenants, it didn't pay his property taxes. So the property got taken back. Um, so the property was deeply neglected, but the deal worked and it had decent fundamentals. And so Yola and I uh, checked it out, did our due diligence, met the onsite manager, put in an online bid and we won the auction. 20 units. $100,000, $5,000 per door. And that includes both the land and the homes, which you see there, $5,000 per unit. Um, and so our first reaction was, yay, high five, we won the deal. And our next reaction was, oh crap, where are we gonna get $100,000? Uh, because this is our first deal. And we called our close friends and family and raised money in $5,000 and $10,000 checks and said, are you willing to take a bet on us? We wanna go in here and work hard and turn this place around. And we think we can get great results for our residents and our investors. And we want you to come for the journey. And so a few people made a bet on us and that was our first deal. And the residents praised us as heroes because we did basic stuff. We paved the roads and fixed their furnaces and treated them the way we would wanna be treated. And we also started delivering really good cash on cash returns for our investors. So that was our first deal. Um, and then we found another deal that we love. Yo, well, do you want to talk about our deal in Renton? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I guess also I just want to throw in a little bit of background um, about how Daniel and I know each other. Um, so Daniel and I are business partners. We're also brothers-in-law. And I met Daniel in 2008 um, when my sister called me up and said, I've been dating this guy for a month. He wants to come home and meet our parents. You need to come home and kind of play the in between, uh, in between person. So I come home and I meet Daniel, um, and we hit it off immediately as friends. A couple of years later, we became investment partners in our first real estate deal, which was a 
duplex that we bought when we were both in graduate school that we converted to a triplex and we were successful with that investment. And in working together as partners, we really kind of came to realize that we're actually, we think very differently, but very complementary. And Daniel's kind of like the big picture, let's go do everything, let's go very fast and grow everywhere. And I'm the, uh, I'm the, the, I don't know, the caboose saying, let's slow down, let's make sure we, we it all checks out, check the numbers, dot the I's, cross the T's. Um, and together we kind of get to the right place. Daniel likes to say, and I guess I say too, Daniel's kind of like pouring the gasoline on the fire and I'm like managing it with the fire extinguisher to make sure it goes in the right direction. And um, really we're, we're, we're excellent partners. And you know, when you work with family, it can either go really well or really poorly. And we are blessed that we love each other. We work exceptionally well together and uh, love growing this business together. So fast forward or rewind, depending on where we're coming from in the story, 2017, December, we buy this property that um, is a really neglected manufactured housing community in a very urban environment. This is located in Renton, Washington, it's like 15 minutes to Seattle airport, 20 minutes to downtown Seattle without traffic, 49 space community that the old owner actually had intended to tear down and turn into a, a museum for Jimi Hendrix. And the city said, we're not gonna let you destroy housing for a museum for Jimi Hendrix, so you put it up for sale. And when we bought it, it was, it was rough but it was really like a diamond in the rough. Um, the managers did not know what they were doing. There were like no rule enforcement. People would wake up in the morning and there would be cars parked across their driveway. So they couldn't get to work uh, because were, the fire lane was being blocked. So we came in and immediately started enforcing rules. We brought in multiple dumpsters and like got all this trash out there. And one of the biggest problems the community had was there wasn't enough parking. And there was this big mud lot in the front of the property with a bunch of abandoned cars. So we came and we towed out the abandoned cars. And in this project, Daniel, myself, and a guy named Rich, who used to work with us, um, we showed up at the property. We stayed in a trailer, which you can see in the back. Rich knew how to drive the Bobcat, and we got to work. And in four days, we made a significant impact to the property. Maybe it was five. Um, we dug out the mud pit. We got, I think, 14 dump truck loads of rock. We laid out road cloth, and we really we built a parking lot. We hammered in parking stops. We labeled spaces, and we told everybody going forward, we're going to start charging for parking. And residents were thrilled. We were going to charge $25 a month. And they said, please charge more. We want the cars out of here. So we started charging $60 a month. And people had a reliable place to park. And they knew that they would wake up in the morning and be able to leave their home. They had spots for their cars. It wasn't a huge mud pit. And then also, we upgraded the front of the community really to start making improvements, make it look nice. So we put in, as you can see, that, that landscaping. We put in a brick wall, which, one, makes the place look nicer, but also is a safety uh, issue where there had been car accidents where cars had hopped the curb and actually ended up in the property. So this added a degree of safety where there's a barrier between the community um, and the very busy road. And this was, you know, we don't get this hands-on. Daniel and I literally stepped on the property and worked on it for four days. It was really fun. Uh, we don't get this hands-on ourselves now, but this is the kind of value we want to add to our properties. And this one obviously has a sweet spot in our heart because we built that parking lot. We helped really transform this community. Residents were really thrilled and that's what we're about is finding win-wins for our investors and our residents. And um, this was kind of a great case study for that. Yeah, thanks you all. Um, so we've grown since then, right? We started off with those two little parks. And at this point we own more than 40 manufactured housing communities in eight states. Um, we serve more than 10,000 residents. Um, really proud of what we've built over the past several years. And we're not doing it alone. We've built a fantastic team and we've made real investments in bringing on top tier talent because we think that's the right way to, to build a sustainable business. And I just wanna um, provide kind of highlights of a few of our senior leadership team members. Um, on the lower left, you'll see our chief operating officer, Corey Wickstrom. He just joined our company. He's a transformative hire. He is, uh, one of the most experienced leaders in the manufactured housing industry in the country. Uh, he's managed hundreds of mobile home parks and built teams of you know hundreds or thousands of people. Um, and we're really excited to have him on board to lead operations. Um, on the acquisition side, we have George Hahn, who comes from a real estate private equity background. Um, our chief financial officer, Mikey, uh, is both a CPA and a licensed attorney. Uh, Jack Walls is our director of home sales, used to sell subdivisions at DR Horton. 
So we've, we've really made investments in talent, which we're really proud of. And just to give you a quick snapshot of what we've accomplished since 2017. So we've scaled up to become a top 50 owner of mobile home parks in the country. Total value of the portfolio is around $300 million. We spent a lot of time building off-market relationships to source attractive mobile home park deals. We built a great operating team. We're selling lots of new manufactured homes and we're delivering great results both to our residents and to our investors. I wanna talk through just a few of the ways that we create value in our properties. Um, and I think I'll start uh, in the upper left there, Rentin, and I'll, I'll work through this clockwise. So Rentin, we already talked about. Yo and I showed up hands-on and took this neglected class C property in a great environment and turned it into a really vibrant community for working families. Meadowlands, uh, on the upper right there, is a really interesting deal. It was kind of development light, where we bought basically an empty park from the Glaspie family. Uh, they had owned it for more than hundred. They owned this land for more than hundred years. They were pioneers in the Yakima Valley, and no brokers were involved. We met this family. We closed the deal over dinner. Um, bought this land in an opportunity zone, which had previously been a cow pasture, and we've been filling it with new homes. Um, we just refinanced it in December, and we'll talk more about the great financial results we delivered. And really, it's very uh, gratifying to build a basically a brand new neighborhood where nothing existed before. Uh, tiny home innovations. I've spent a lot of time developing these very innovative two bedroom, one bath homes in a tiny 399 square foot footprint. They even have a sleeping loft up on top. So it's almost like a three bedroom, one bath home in a tiny footprint. And it's a viable source of housing for working families. Um, and then finally, solar energy. You know, we invested a million and a half dollars at one of our properties to build a 600 kilowatt solar power plant, which is a huge win for the environment and a great financial win for our investors because of the bonus depreciation, the federal tax credit, and raising net operating income by reducing our energy expense. And we're actually currently in the process of building our second solar power installation at an RV park we own in Bakersfield. Yo, do you wanna talk through kind of a few of the highlights here on, on deals that we have either sold or refinanced? Yeah, happy to. And I'll, I'll, I'll do that with a, an intro that generally, I think Daniel mentioned, our, our strategy is long-term holders. So we believe these are really resilient, amazing real estate assets. They're hard to come by. We invest in them, we improve them because we're long-term holders. So in most cases, we don't actually look to sell them. We look to return capital to investors by refinancing and continuing to uh, generate cash flow from these assets for very long term. So you'll see what we're calling round trips are um, deals that we've done in the past couple of years that have kind of come at least to some degree full circle where we hit a milestone that has given us monetary and you know, a, a, a feather in our cap and actual numbers as to how we've performed. So I'm going to skip the first column to Larry Royal Palms. And the four columns to the right are four properties that we bought in 2017 and we've refinanced. And in some cases, we've pulled out, um, I think actually in all four of these cases, we've the proceeds from the refinancing exceeded all the capital we put in um, for the property for the acquisition. Um, so you can see in rented, we paid $3.25 million in December 2017. And in June of 2020, we refinanced at uh, five five point five five million, we pulled out more than the entire purchase price, um, more than all the equity that was put in, um, in in that uh, in that refinancing. Um, and then on the left, you know, we are long term holders, but we will sell in certain times. Um, we made an investment in Tulare, California. It's a nice park, but we were not as long term optimistic about the market um, as we were when we bought the property in the Central Valley of California, which is pretty drought struck right now. And it, a, lot of the a lot of the industry or a lot of the uh, uh, employment there comes from agriculture and you can't grow things without water. So we wanted to position our assets for long-term holding and we decided to leave that position when we got an offer we really couldn't refuse where we bought the property for $5.5 million in 2019. Two and a half years later, we sold it for $10.2 million. And you can see the performance numbers there 
uh, came to a 35% annualized return to investors and investors got 2.3 times back their money. And so we're really proud of our investment. We've done really well there and we will sell you know, kind of selectively, but overall, this kind of shows our strategy is long triple. Great. And I, I would just add uh, one thing I'm proud of is if you look at the um, value increase percent, which is, you know, um, got what, one, two, three, four, the fifth row. Um, of the five deals we've sold or refinanced since 2017, the lowest increase in value is 40%. And on the high end, it's more than 100%. And I think that's really a testament to how hard we're working to create value. You know, that, thinking back to that last slide I showed, we're out there building solar power plants, bringing in new homes, enforcing park rules, working closely with residents, you, repaving parks. You know, we're in the trenches with our 70 employees. And this kind of shows the results. Um, so I do want to talk through our most recent fund. Prior to last summer, we did a lot of single asset syndications. So we'd find a deal, we'd go raise money for that specific deal. Last summer, we reached a point where our business had grown so much that we had half a dozen good deals and contract all at once. And we realized it didn't make sense to keep doing single asset syndications. It was time to raise a fund. Um, so we raised fund one last summer. It was $18 million, uh, which is very small by commercial real estate standards, but we were very comfortable with that as a, you know, a comfortable amount of capital to go deploy. Um, we have gone and bought eight assets diversified across four states. Um, I'm proud to say that we deployed about 80% of fund one's capital within six months of raising it because, we have, because of our robust deal pipeline. Um, and we have not yet sold or refinanced any of these deals. It's too early for that. Um, but based on how these properties are performing, we think we're on track to deliver an IRR, which is greater than 16% to our investors. And we think we'll at least double our investors' money in fund one. Um, so that gives you kind of a baseline of performance for what we've been doing to date. I also want to point out we're not just buying parks, we're also building new ones. This is a key part of our strategy. Um, basically, there is a ton of demand for manufactured housing communities, both from residents who would love to live in these communities, but there's just no vacancies, and from investors like us who are competing to buy a limited supply of parks. And so we think the opportunity is right to build new mobile home parks, um, given the intense need for affordable housing. We looked around the country, we picked Bozeman, Montana as our target market. Um, for those of you who don't know Bozeman, um, it is an incredible lifestyle destination, it has skiing, fly fishing, a university, breweries, cool coffee shops. Um, and especially during COVID, as people can work from home, you've got an influx of people moving from the coasts who wanna live in Bozeman. Um, and as a result, the median home price in Bozeman over the past three years has risen from $400,000 to $700,000. So all the people who make Bozeman feel like Bozeman, like the ski instructors and the fishing guides and the craft brewers and essential people like nurses and teachers and firefighters, um, they can't afford a $700,000 house. So we picked this as, as a, our target market partnered up with our local partner, Brenna Kelleher. She's a fourth generation Montanan um, and found 90 acres. Closed on the land. Um, we are in the process of developing a new 254 unit manufactured housing community. There's a picture of me on the farm with the horse. If you, if you look at the slide here, that's what the land is, is like uh, today. Um, I'm proud to say we just had our first manufactured home ship out there about a month ago, which is gonna serve as our sales center. And we hope to start selling homes um, this August. So I'm really excited about developing new class A communities. I'll just add the background to my picture here is the living room of the, of the house that we put in those. I'm pretty proud of it as well. Yes, thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> yeah. So, Yol, do you wanna talk a little bit about fund two and kind of what's the strategy and what are the highlights? Yeah, that's all I have to do. So we're, going to be investing in a diversified portfolio of mobile home parks, RV parks, and development projects. 
Um, as you can see from the map, we've been busy. Uh, we've got a lot of projects in escrow. That means they're under contract. We're performing diligence on them with the presumption that we're going to be buying them. So you're not investing into a completely blind fund. We know a lot of the deals that will go into this, this investment vehicle already. Um, and you can see from the light blue on the map, like we're looking at other properties as well. And um, we have a very exciting pipeline. So overall, we're thinking this is going to be an eight to 15 investments. It'll be about a thousand, thousand lots. Um, the target equity raise is $20 million and we'll take loans on top of that. Uh, a question we're asked often is, you know, what are the terms of what kind of loans we're, we're taking? So it's usually a combination of bank debt and agency financing, which is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, when you have larger stabilized communities, we get from Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, it's really good long-term low cost money. Um, and we've built a bunch of very strong banking relationships that have um, a lot of flexibility. And we're, it's one of our competitive advantages that we can look at deals and know that they'll be financeable very quickly. And we're usually borrowing 50 to 75% of the purchase price in loans. Typically it's closer to 60, 65 is where we're usually working. And as far as returns go, Actually, I'm going to skip the returns. We're going to come back to that in a, in a later slide. Um, Daniel, if you want to go to the next page, we can talk about some of the specific deals that we've identified that are going to go. Oh, nope. we're going to first talk about um, the risk return spectrum as we look at it um, across the asset types. So we, as I mentioned, it's going to be a diversified pool of properties. And they're going to range from very stabilized manufactured housing communities. And these are in core markets or super high quality these are properties that have 100% occupancy and you always collect your rent. And the reason is like somebody moves out, somebody sells their home, nobody moves in until we get our rent paid. So in these properties we own, it's 100% rent collection. It's super reliable, gradually increasing rents. And the returns there are lower because the risk is low. On the other far end of the spectrum, as Daniel kind of talked about with Bozeman, we're taking raw land and we're turning it into manufactured housing communities that has construction risk, that has bringing in homes and selling. And so there we obviously have a much higher uh, threshold for returns that would make sense of work. And we think we have some really exciting um, deals in that space as well. And in between there, we have RV parks on the high side. Um, RV parks work in kind of two fashions. So one is uh, recreational. That's what most people think of when you go on vacation, you go stay in an RV park and it really, it's, it's a hotel where you bring your own room and they have amenities and they have, teachers and a lot of staff. And there's also long-term RV, which is a combination of people who will stay for years in parks and they treat it like live in a tiny home. And you have certain people by nature are transit, construction workers, traveling nurses. Uh, they come, they'll stay for some number of months. We skew much heavier towards the uh, long-term stay where we operate them very similar to mobile home parks, but because these are homes that can be moved much easier, they trade at a, uh, they, they they have higher risk, they have more uh, turnover, and so they, they deliver higher returns, but we operate them very similar to mobile home parks. And then in between, really our sweet spot is value add manufactured housing communities. That's where we're coming in, we're fixing roads, adding homes, upgrading the parks, and that's most of our bread and butter. So this is three deals that are being going into the fund. Um, the first one is in Gerald, Texas. Uh, we partnered with a local developer um, and Gerald's a town just outside of Austin, which is arguably the hottest real estate market in the country right now. And found this piece of land, added, uh, put 66 manufactured home sites on it and started bringing in homes. And we're working with a local dealer on this one to bring in homes. We were supposed to close on it with having very few homes on site. Right now there's already 12 homes on site and we think there'll be 20 homes on site by the time we buy it. So it'll actually be a third occupied. Uh, we had projected it would take two years to fill up. It's looking like it'll actually be faster. Um, in this model, the faster you fill it, the higher your returns are. So we actually expect the returns might exceed the 13%. It's a really, really nice community, and we're excited about owning it. Um, in the middle is Donnelly, Idaho. It's a development uh, project. Um, I was actually out, out there last week on site for a community meeting. And Donnelly is in a ski town. It's 10 minutes from Tamarack Ski Resort. Um, it's an area two hours north of Boise, uh, and it's getting all of the effects of Boise. And really, Idaho's population is booming. People are moving there from all over the country. And Donnelly is an amazing recreation area. There's a huge lake, there's ski resorts, there's a lot of uh, snowmobiling, and housing is incredibly unaffordable. It's really a repeat of the Bozeman story. 
And we're developing a 201 unit community in an opportunity zone. And we think it's gonna be a really a slam dunk project we're very excited about. And then another deal that's gonna be going into the fund, we're gonna be closing it uh, in the second week of April next week, um, is in Greeley, Colorado. It's a long-term stay RV park. It's been managed by a family owners for the last 20 years. And what we find a lot of the deals we buy are purchased from what we call mom and pop, you know, non-institutional non owners. And they, they ran it that way. Um, there's, you know, they've, they've had lower um, occupancy than the market would have uh, because they are oddly selective on who they let in. Uh, we have a park that's 20 minutes away that's full and they have 20% vacancy. And so we have a great opportunity to come in and professionalize the management of the property and deliver strong returns uh, in a market we know pretty well. Thanks, y'all. Yeah. So I, I do wanna talk through one thing that makes mobile home parks special, and that is bonus depreciation. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details here. I just wanna share with you that this is one of the key reasons that investors like investing in mobile home parks because we deliver a lot of tax losses, which get passed through on our investors K-1, and our investors can take that tax loss and apply it directly against their income tax bill. Um, so just, if you have questions about this, please get in touch. Yoel uh, happens to be a CPA. Our CFO is also a CPA. We've got the, the qualifications on our team to answer your questions, but just very high level, um, Mobile home parks are special. They generate more pass-through tax losses than any other real estate asset class that we're aware of. Um, on this example deal in the park we bought in Gold Bar, Washington, if you had invested $100,000, you would have gotten $215,000 of year one tax loss in the deal. And you can apply that against your passive income. Even if you're not a real estate professional, even if you are... Um, just a normal passive investor in the deal, you can apply that tax loss against passive income from other sources. Or if you don't have passive income from other sources, you can carry it forward and then apply it against the income from your investment in our deal, which basically creates a, a tax-free income stream. Um, so this is not tax advice. Consult your own CPA. Um, and if you have more questions, please feel free to, to ask us about it. I want to talk a little bit about our investor experience. What's it like if you invest with us? Um, so let's say you wanna invest in fund two. You would need to make a decision before June 30th. When you subscribe, 50% of your capital is due upfront. The remaining 50% will call over time, roughly over six to 12 months. You'll get quarterly email updates uh, about every property in the fund. And here we show a snapshot of what our investor reporting looks like. So you can see our park performance summary. And then uh, financially, we direct deposit distributions to your bank account every quarter. We have a secure online investor portal, which stores all your documents, all your records. We deliver your K-1, which is your annual tax statement, every year by March 31st through our investor portal. I like to say we have a personal touch. We're still a small company. We have close relationships with our investors. A lot of our investors are our friends, our family members, our former colleagues. Um, so you know, we consider this really a community of investors and we, we welcome questions from investors and we love meeting our investors in person. So we're actually doing uh, a series of investor meet and greets right now in cities across the country, as well as in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. So if any of these dates work for you, um, in the coming weeks, we're going to be in New York, Seattle, Portland, Los Angeles, Denver, uh, New Haven, Tel Aviv, and Jerusalem. Um, so please RSVP on that link if you're able to come meet us. Um, yeah, well, do you want to talk through the terms and let's try and keep it pretty high level, but at least cover the main points? Sure. Um, so... Let's see, we talked about the purposes to buy a diversified pool of, of uh, investments. Um, capital allocation, we talked about how it's gonna be called over time and it's gonna be diversified across the state to 15 properties. We talked about the whole period being evergreen. So we're gonna hold, the intention is to hold for a very long time. We may sell selectively. 
Um, I think it's going to talk about target returns. So there are two ways to look at returns. The typical way in private equity is to talk about IRR, which is the annualized rate of return. Um, and while we do talk about that throughout our deck, we always project it on a theoretical 10-year hold. Um, we feel that IRR is not the ideal metric to really look at our properties. It doesn't align with our strategy. The higher IRRs are usually generated by buying a property, making some changes to it, and selling it a year or two later. Um, it's great if your idea is to kind of come in and make quick flips, but we believe in being long-term holders both because we love the assets and because we want to invest in and benefit from the investments we make into our communities. So we really look at this as a, as a tool to compound wealth. And we look at it as an equity multiple basis to say, every dollar you put in, how much are you going to get out? And the challenge there is eventually it could be three, four, five X. It's really a function of how long we hold the properties. And so when coming up with how we charge fees and how we split profits with investors, uh, we built a, what we call a waterfall, how we split the, 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 pro, the proceeds with investors. Um, to really align our incentive. And our motivation is to return capital back to investors um, as quickly as possible so that we then get greater share of the economics in the property. So I'm jumping down to the bottom right here, but the way it works is for investors will invest and the first part of the, the waterfall, the split of profits comes from a preferred return. So the basic preferred return is 5% annual return. And for people who invest over $500,000, the 6% annual return. So until we exceed those hurdles, the preferred return hurdle, investors receive all of the, all of the economics. Once cash flow receipt exceeds the preferred return, we split, per, we split uh, distributions with investors, 70% to investors, 30% to us as the sponsor. And we do that until we've returned all invested capital and another 50% of invested capital. So once you've received $1.5 for every dollar that uh, you invested. Um, at that point, we go from being 70-30 split to 50-50 split. And that's kind of how we, again, partner and our incentive is to, as quick as possible, return, return your invested capital, return, get to 1.5 equity multiple on top of your preferred return. Um, and then we become kind of 50-50 partners. Uh, on top of that, there are a few fees that we charge. So we charge an acquisition and due diligence fee on property, 2% of the, of the purchase price. Uh, we charge a 5% management fee, that's 5% of gross rents collected. Um, the way to look at that is it's a, it's, a, it's a market fee that if we didn't do the management work, we would hire a third-party management firm. Uh, we've always believed and still do that our being hands-on managers is a competitive advantage. So we don't ever outsource that really. Uh, but that is a market rate. Um, we charge a CapEx or development construction management fee uh, between five and 6%, depending on the scope of the project. So if we're building an expansion and adding lots, we would charge a fee on that. Um, and then manufactured procurement um, install and sales. So depending on uh, the park and the home, it's generally we bring in homes and we have a, a dealership that we control. Um, and it's really there to serve our property. So we bring in homes, we set them up, we charge an administrative fee for that work. And then we have a sales commission um, that we charge when we're filling in a property, uh, filling up a property. Um, and then finally, there's a personal recourse and loan guarantee fee where Daniel and I personally sign as guarantors on loans. Um, not always, but when we do, um, we charge a 2% fee to compensate us for the risk that we're taking there. Um, as we're signing up our, you know, our personal wealth outside of these properties to guarantee that the properties are going to perform. Um, and then as Daniel talked about, we have significant tax losses that get passed through to investors. Those are split pro rata rateably across the ownership of the, uh, of the fund. That's a high level overview and happy to kind of, if there's specific questions, happy to answer questions on the terms. Thank you, y'all. So I think the last slide we're going to show here is next steps and how to invest. Um, I do, again, want to emphasize we are only open to accredited investors, and every investor will need to verify that they are accredited. Um, if you're interested in investing or learning more, go to threepillarcommunities.invportal.com. That's our investor portal. Click it. You can create a profile, and you'll see our full offering which will include our private placement memorandum, the company agreement, the subscription agreement, as well as a uh, more in-depth overview than what we showed here. 
and a frequently asked questions document, FAQ, compiling the questions we get from a lot of investors. So please click, you can find the materials there. If you have any other questions, feel free to email us anytime at investorrelations at threepillarcommunities.com. And we're still a small company. You'll get an answer either from me or Yoel or Mikey, our CFO, or Ruby, our head of investor relations. Um, and we would love to hear from you. So with that, we will wrap this up. Um, just want to say again, we are a mission-driven company with a two-part mission. We want to deliver safe, reliable housing to our residents and safe, reliable returns to our investors. That's what motivates us every day. And we'd love to have you join us as part of the journey. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot.